Thank you. I, I feel very fortunate indeed to have been asked to participate in this uh, conference. I love the format, and I especially love seeing so many familiar faces, people I've known for a good many years, uh, more recent colleagues, uh, former students, and friends and current students. Um, some of us go back to the days when I didn't have to wear my glasses when I gave a talk and um, other uh, changes. I kind of wish now that I had an opportunity to, to, to give the, uh, the closing notes uh, at the beginning of this conference because I find that, that everything that I have to say that I thought was important has already been said in many ways and, and often uh, much more articulately than I could, could muster. I've, uh, I've enjoyed uh, uh, not only the data talks but also the discussions, the back and forth questions and I think that there is a tremendous amount of commonality uh, here. I've, I haven't been a, uh, a child researcher for a, a long time. Um, so there are many conferences that focus on children and adolescents I haven't been to. Uh, but I got a feeling that some really wonderful work is, is happening in those places. I've been studying um, mainly um, uh, adolescents and older adolescents and the transition to adulthood for the last uh, number of years. And I'm really going to be talking today um, about a perspective that's based on, say, roughly uh, 35 years uh, plus of research in, in that field. And I, um, I am um, taking very seriously the request that Mitch made that I, that I talk about where we've been and where we need to go and kind of uh, predictions of the future. So uh, bear with me a little bit through a, a, a trip down memory lane. Um, I've done a lot of uh, research myself over the years in, in various ways, but uh, emphasizing longitudinal studies, multiple risk factors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I want to frame about what we have learned and, and where we kind of are today is around uh, these four <coughs> topics. Many of you will recall um, that the conceptualizations of child and adolescent depression have changed enormously over the years, that it seems hard to believe that childhood depression was discovered in, in several decades ago, um, and it was not masked, it was not uh, hidden in adolescent sturm und drang, but we decided that if you look for it, um, it's there, and it resembles uh, other ways in which we understand depression. We've also learned over the years that we can't really lump childhood, adolescent, and adult depression together. They probably are somewhat different entities with different causal factors and courses and different meanings. So all depressions are not necessarily the same, and so the, the issue of development um, figures in um, immediately when we consider the, the topics. In fact, I would say that what we've learned over time is that rather than um, continuing to apply downward uh, extensions of adult models of depression, we probably need to view adolescent onset depression as probably the most common prototype of depression and our work needs to be basically upward extensions um, from what we learn about um, adolescent depression. And of course, some children actually develop true depression in childhood, but it's, it's more commonly arising in adolescence. I think that the diagnostic developments that we've seen um, are kind of ironic in the, in the current context because we're still struggling. We're still struggling with key issues. Not so many years ago, um, the distinction was formalized between unipolar and bipolar depression or disorders, and that made an enormous um, growth uh, in the field of depression possible. In fact, depression research probably became the most uh, common form of psychopathology research, and it certainly enabled generations of, of treatment developments uh, that have proven to be uh, really um, groundbreaking uh, for, for, um, for the field and, and for the community. Um, using DSM criteria for children with relatively few modifications, um, 
was uh, came into into shape uh, during this period. Um, but increasingly, um, even many years ago, we started to realize the problems of heterogeneity, problems of comorbidity, and so forth, that made it very difficult to to decide. Um, what we're characterizing, what, how general are our models and findings, and, and obviously uh, we have been struggling for years, and now it's, uh, uh, well, it's encoded in the, uh, in the RDOC, um, alternative ways to define and characterize the phenotype. Um, we're not there yet, but we've been working on this problem for a very long time, and so we might have some, some um, agreement about needing to to do things a little bit differently, but I, I think uh, well we'll we'll come back to the point about uh, what are the what are the uh, best ways to proceed um, uh, in an organized fashion. With respect to methodological changes over the past 35 or so years, um, clearly uh, depression was the new kid on the block some years ago. And, and psychopathologists studying mood disorders were not paying too much attention to what had already been discovered and determined in, say, uh, schizophrenia research, anxiety disorders, and so forth. And I still think it's worth emphasizing the need uh, for the uh, cross-fertilization across different forms of psychopathology and, of course, the awareness of the ways in which there are general issues and themes that are cross-cutting within psychopathology. Um, the bipolar field is relatively new uh, now compared to um, uh, the field of unipolar depression, uh, which is a somewhat maturing field, uh, but there are lots of new developments uh, left to be made in bipolar disorder. Most of what I'm going to talk about today is not about bipolar disorder, but some things are pertinent. We've seen a move over the years um, from a time in which uh, you had to study clinical populations. You had to have clinical samples, which was discouraging for people who weren't working in medical settings or, uh, or somehow were not um, even uh, some of them, not clinicians themselves. However, we, we came to understand that the, that the use of clinical samples probably wasn't the best idea. Uh, because the clinical samples are usually not typical samples. And so there, there's been a very strong movement toward um, use of community samples, use of high-risk samples, and so forth. And increasingly, of course, we're seeing uh, much more um, use, uh, a return, shall we say, to experimental um, paradigms, experimental psychopathology, uh, manipulations, and um, uh, lab types of studies. Um, there is a continuing problem, though, that I think is much, as much of a problem now as it's been before, and that is the issue of methodolatry. I didn't coin that word, I uh, wish I had, but I've always loved it. And, and you know what I'm talking about, the tendency to latch on to the, the latest tool, the latest way of doing something, the latest machine, the latest technology, with not as equal uh, concern, shall we say, with the basics of uh, psychometric uh, strengths, reliability and validity, and certainly ecological validity. Um, and, and we have to be careful that our research is not being shaped by our toys um, and instead continues to be driven by um, strong conceptualization and hypothesis testing. Um, with respect to what what we've been doing and where we've been in terms of conceptual and theoretical issues. Um, most um, developing fields, as, as this one was 35 years ago or so, uh, are mostly descriptive. You start off doing descriptive studies and, uh, and you move eventually with more knowledge to uh, theoretically based studies and hypothesis driven studies. There's still there's always a need for more descriptive work, and we're certainly struggling with that in terms of, of um, um, deconstructing the constructs, shall we say, of, of depression and subtypes and whatever. But we, we now really um, require a degree of um, 
conceptualization, theory building, and, and, um, and hypothesis-driven studies, models have become, accordingly, much more integrative across uh, multiple levels of analysis. That's, that's been apparent to everybody um, over the last at least 20 years, probably longer. People keep building, at least on paper, more and more complicated models. Um, I wish I could draw in three dimensions, but unfortunately uh, I can't do that. I can barely think in that way. But the, the levels of analysis that we really need to understand and integrate are breathtakingly difficult to, to study. Um, and so the ten tendency and the temptation is to simplify. Simplify, simplify, but this kind of meaning at least is one antidote to the necessary issue of simplification because we can share ideas and we can build in that way um, which will lead to the complexity that is needed and that, we, uh, that we're all aspiring to but often just can't put together. Um, we've, we've heard some masterful talks today about integrative studies across different methods and different, uh, different types of uh, levels of analysis. And I think that's really marvelous work, but um, the level of, uh, of, of difficulty and complexity, I think, is beyond um, what most people can do in individual labs. There, of course, is a, has, along with the complexity, has come an increasing focus on uh, biological uh, methods, variables, and so forth. But, but there are pitfalls there, and I'll, I'll allude to some of these along the way. Um, what, what we have also seen conceptually is the, um, the development of models of depression in which uh, stress was kind of lurking in the background to the point where now it's very clear from almost every talk today that stress is one of the, the, the main players in our attempt to understand how depression comes about. The intersection of stress and depression is really where we are right now and are going to have to continue to be, but moving away toward descriptive, toward really delving into and explicating mechanisms by which stress has its effects. And what I've seen today, which is in some ways um, a little um, delightfully surprising to me is how, how far people are, are going with dealing with stress in complex ways now. And I've been uh, thoroughly um, entertained and, um, and educated about some, uh, some new projects going on in labs. It's exciting. So those are the kinds of uh, conceptual and, and um, uh, broad uh, themes that have guided the research for a while. But what have we actually found out? You know, what are the empirical uh, uh, conclusions that we can draw over um, this last period? Well, clearly, this is a list, not in any particular order, of what we know to be risk factors for depression. Uh, these are the main risk factors, I would say, arguably, some people might disagree, but these are the ones that keep po popping up again and again. If you, if you don't have some of these in your model, you're going you're, you're gonna, you're gonna to miss uh, some uh, uh, good effect sizes. But stressful life events and chronic stressors, uh, maternal depression, one of the strongest predictors of depression is having a depressed parent, particularly a depressed mother. Uh, social and interpersonal dysfunction, being female, family discord, um, uh, a number of constructs that, are, that represent personality and temperament and clinical features are predictors like neuroticism, uh, prior depression, early onset anxiety disorders, and, and of course uh, gene environment interactions um, as well. Now there are Definitely other things that contribute variance, but um, I, I wanted to, um, to just say the obvious. These are the things we know. How are we going to do better now? So we need to move on to mechanisms. How do these things work? How do they work together? And, and it turns out that uh, um, over the years, um, researchers have not ignored 
the role of stress. As I said, it often was in the background, and there were some studies that uh, that later adopted or models that adopted a diathesis stress formulation. But even in some of those models, the the stress part was um, implicit, um, and the focus was on the diatheses. Um, and everybody was really, in some way or another, addressing the question of following stress, why does person A get depressed and person B does not? Um, and a lot of people uh, were mostly uh, looking at the uh, moderators, uh, such as uh, cognitive moderators, uh, genetic, parenting, etc. cetera. And, um, and of course, there are a, a number of those factors that are critically important to continue to study as moderators and mediators. And, and, the, and good strides have been made by many of the uh, people in this room. Um, and I was pleased that this comment that, um, as at the bottom here, stress is often inferred, is not measured, or it's measured poorly. I think, I think I, having heard what I've heard today, I, I can say, no, this is not quite true. Some people are doing a really good job at capturing stress constructs. But we really have a long way to go on, on getting to the bottom of what the different elements are, and I'll say more about that soon. OK. Um, what have we learned about stress and depression? You know, How do we know that we have come to a kind of a crossroads where the, this is the, the, key, um, the key concern? Um, not the only concern, but a key concern. What have we learned? We've certainly learned that overall stress is a very powerful proximal risk factor. We've learned that the, and this, this has been developing over the last few years, and I think I heard a, a level of commonality today that I don't always hear uh, when I am around stress researchers, but it's interpersonal stressors. It's relational stressors. Uh, it's the social context of stress that seems to be particularly um, associated with depression for most people. Obviously, there are individual differences in that, but for most people, social stressors are where the action is. And I would say uh, probably even further, we could say um, intimate relationship stressors. Um, but that could include good friends as well as family and um, uh, parent-child relationships, romantic relationships. We've definitely seen an expansion of, of the way in which stress is, is conceptualized and measured. And it's, it's, it now clearly goes beyond the, the idea of acute life events. That used to be the, the stress measure was stressful life events. But now um, I'd like to put in a, a pitch for including chronic stress more commonly. Um, I like measuring chronic stress across different domains, but there are other ways that people have used uh, chronic stress in terms of, say, uh, economic uh, disadvantage, uh, discrimination, um, health problems, and so forth. But chronic stress, you know what? Even if you don't measure it, it's still in your equation, and it's best to, to find out what exactly is the separate role that, and, or maybe different role that chronic stress is playing. We've heard a lot about early adversities. And um, I would also add that we probably need to be paying more attention to the idea of um, cumulative exposure. The trouble with, well, let's say early adversities is, first of all, I absolutely resonate with the idea that we've got to get down to the content. We've got to really understand why this one might have a different impact than that one. But we also have to address the question of, when we say early adversity, is that what's having the impact? Or is, is it the earliness? Or is it the fact that early adversity predicts continuing adversity, both acute and chronic? So I think there are some, some complicated questions um, so that uh, people who are interested in stress still have plenty to do. There's just, we haven't, we haven't addressed the full story. Um, okay, I've talked about stress uh, being a, um, uh, in its various forms a powerful predictor, 
I wanted to uh, illustrate uh, this point in a in a way uh, from a study that uh, that uh, Kendler Gardner and Prescott wrote in 2002, and it was one of those okay, I'm packing my bags and going home now. Um, this was the end all be all of that particular era, uh, but this was a magnificent large scale longitudinal study of uh, female twins. And um, Kindler and, and that group uh, looked at 18 different risk factors. And in purple, I've uh, highlighted which ones, and these are across different developmental epochs. The purple ones are, are ones that I think really are forms of stress. And there are lots of them in that list of, of 18 uh, different predictors. Um, And what he found was that overall, this set of predictors, which is basically from that list that I showed you earlier, it counts for 52% uh, of the variance in depression. So that's why I felt like, okay, um, all right, what can we do to improve on that? Not very darn much. Um, so if you haven't read that study for a while, it's pretty impressive to go back and look at it. Uh, but recognize that this was the end all be all of a certain kind of model representing really what was going on at that time and to an extent has continued um, uh, to play a role but it's uh, it's nonetheless in its uh, scope and quality it's really uh, um, unparalleled. Um, I, I also looked at some of those same um, variables in our longitudinal study of uh, kids of depressed mothers and I've uh, just, these are a few that I just pulled out, you know, I had an extra hour and I thought, that'd be fun, let's see. I was, in, I was so blown away by Kindler's study, but I, I'd be curious, what would happen if I did that? Just a simple regression analysis. The ones listed in red are stress related. So once again, that, that list is full of uh, stressors. And we came out with a, a very uh, strong uh, uh, overall R, and if you throw in, in addition, having, uh, as Kindler did, having uh, an episode of depression in the last, you know, X number of years, um, you really get a huge amount of uh, prediction of depression. So, okay, so yes, that just means that we are, uh, we know, we have the content, you know, the stress depression content is, is there. And so where do we go from there? Um, Interpersonal stressors, I think that's one thing for us to try to unpack and to try to understand more about. Um, I'll just give you, this is not a data talk, but I'll give you some, uh, some um, things that have come out of our lab, um, basically showing that uh, the, you get a, a stronger predictive relationship between uh, um, depression and interpersonal stressors compared with uh, non-interpersonal stressors. And, and those, uh, f those features can be uh, magnified by having certain kinds of uh, social trait, dysfunctional social traits like insecure attachment representations, uh, sociotropic values, and so forth. And, and this is particularly pertinent to females. Um, we found that even as young as five, and if we'd had the variables uh, measured earlier, it, might, it probably would have shown up even earlier, but at age five, social withdrawal, just measured by a, a few items uh, from the CBCL, uh, predicts chronic interpersonal stress, chronic social stress by, by age 15. Um, so early social withdrawal seems to portend ongoing difficulties in social relationships, and those are predictive of age 20 uh, major depression. So as early, uh, very early in life, you, you start to see social things that seem to, to portend um, depression. I'm not suggesting that this is a unique risk factor for depression or that it will lead um, only to depression, but it, it, it does seem to indicate that the signs are, are there and we just need to uh, put our, uh, find a magnifying glass to shed some more light on that. Chronic social stress 
is, um, is in, at age 15, uh, which we characterize pretty well in, in our large um, um, high-risk study, chronic social stress across peer relationships, family relationships, personal romantic relationships, that chronic measure <coughs> aggregated across those domains predicts a lot of bad things that are, that are if not permanent, at least enduring. Uh, this is uh, what I came to call a facet of stress generation. Uh, which I'll say more about later, but basically being, uh, having relationship problems at age 15 predicts uh, bad mate selection by age 20. It predicts uh, getting into a relationship where there's domestic violence, even in the teenage years. It means uh, it predicted uh, uh, women having babies as teenagers in circumstances that were, uh, that were um, likely to lead to ongoing financial and, and other kinds of problems. Um, so clearly chronic and acute interpersonal or social stressors are very potent predictors not only of depression but also of continuing stress and depression and ongoing um, cycles. Um, we've also in our lab we've, we've, we've uh, talked about the ways in which um, relational difficulties are not just a cause of depression, but they're also a correlate and a consequence. So you get a depression is more than just the symptoms. It is a set of traits and, and uh, behaviors um, from sociability to dependency, excess, excess uh, reassurance seeking. It usually is associated with uh, having been exposed to parenting dysfunctions, which then often portend having parenting dysfunctions in one's own family with one's own children. Uh, stressful family discord and disruption are in the backgrounds of kids who have these social problems. Um, and so the, uh, the children, say, of depressed mothers are not just inheriting whatever genetic contribution to depression, but they are inheriting a context an environment which is highly stressful uh, in terms of discord, um, exposure to poor role models, um, adverse social skill development, and, and learning to cope with uh, conflicts. So, so I, I want to uh, come back, circle back to the issue of uh, needing to expand our constructs and our definitions of, of stress to include not only um, in its acute and chronic forms and its, and its cumulative form, but also to understand more about the particular content factors that are uh, likely to be associated with depression. Now, in addition to the concepts that we've been focused on over the years and the findings that we have uh, come to, uh, to find um, uh, uh, common agreement about, we've also learned something about the right relationship between stress and depression. In other words, the way in which these two are related to each other has also changed over the course of time. So we say now that we, as if we always knew it, but we didn't, that the stress-depression relationship is not unidirectional, and the diathesis stress models always implicitly assumed a unidirectional um, uh, uh, pattern. And, and now we know, or now I'm going to say a few words about how it's not unidirectional. Um, we used to think it was static. It worked the same way across the course of development or across the lifetime. But now we know that the link between stress and depression is dynamic. It changes. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about some of these constructs. And most assuredly not, the stress-depression relationship is not simple. And so we have come to the point of really needing these new and integrative and multiple level kinds of mo models that, um, that we can barely draw, much less enact in our laboratories, but that's where we are. And of course, the importance of interpersonal stressors has become 
a part of uh, what we've learned about this stress depression relationship. Okay, um, it's not a unidirectional relationship. Um, some years back, we, we and others started to realize that, that, that people cause stressors. The stressors just don't, don't just befall people, but people contribute to the occurrence of stressors. And this is uh, particularly true among people with histories of depression, particularly true of uh, creating or contributing to interpersonal uh, relational issues. And of course, this stress generation process that I call it um, is pernicious because it leads to continuing um, ongoing depression, more stress, more depression. So it's really um, a model of recurrent depression, which of course is the kind of depression that all of us are most concerned about. What else did we learn in our lab about um, stress generation? Um, well, um, it runs in families. It's um, stress exposure and stress generation are are likely to occur in the children of depressed mothers as well as in the mothers themselves. So it's an intergenerational process. I don't have time to speculate, but I think we can all um, have some thoughts about how and why that occurs. Um, we also have learned in our lab, and a, a shout out to uh, Chris Conway, um, who I am uh, proud to have attend here, a former student and now a postdoc, Depressive uh, disorder is not the only type of psychopathology that is related to uh, the generation of stress. But if you, um, if you control for um, broad, um, broad factors um, um, across other disorders as well as control for, in, a, in other words, like internalizing factors and extract an externalizing factor and control for those, control for individual um, comorbidities in other psych psychopathologies and so forth. It turns out that major depressive disorder is particularly uniquely associated with interpersonal dependent stressors, that is, interpersonal events that the person has contributed to. Um, and, um, and in our lab we also have shown that that this tendency of stress generation is associated with the, uh, the short allele of the uh, serotonin transporter gene. Um, what about dynamic? What led us to, uh, or many of us, to the idea, to the conclusion that this, that any model of stress depression relationships has to be dynamic? It has to account for the fact that the relationship changes. And one uh, way to think about that has been called sensitization, stress sensitization. And it means different things to different people. But it, it, um, it, it may mean that some people are more reactive to stress because of stable individual differences or, or acquired differences. Um, that the, or it could mean that people experience lowered threshold of responding to stress. Um, so that some people, it takes less stress to trigger a depressive reaction uh, than others. And the, the kindling notion is that, that um, there may be factors um, that um, operate within individuals and over time such that first episodes may be more likely to be triggered by stressors or by major stressors uh, compared to later, later um, episodes. So clearly, um, uh, our group and others have been interested in this dynamic association. And I would certainly um, also throw out um, uh, the finding that we had, uh, because we had an opportunity to look at stress-depression relationships over a 20-year period, and we found that um, stress predicts stress. Stress predicts depression, depression predicts stress, and you can find these intergenerational stress generation and stress reactivity patterns over time, uh, particularly among kids who experience early adversity in the first five years of life. That the kids with uh, those experiences are much more likely to go on uh, to have continuing stress, both chronic and acute over time. 
so that at any given moment when you're taking a slice of, of, of stress measure, um, bear in mind that we're really talking about a dynamic process and that stress is continuous um, in addition to the relationship between stress and depression changing over time or over course or uh, as the last uh, part says over developmental processes so clearly um, the developmental processes both normal and dysfunctional may may change the nature of the relationship uh, the people's reactions to stress over time and I've uh, in in uh, microscopic uh, lettering there I put that down just so I could mention people whose work I've read recently uh, that has been very informative at least for me and, and new to, to me to some extent uh, Island and Romeo Hostenar and Gunner Karmeloff Smith Casey at all have all written about the developmental aspects of uh, of stress responsiveness, uh, mostly in the HPA axis, but, um, but more generally the idea of development playing a role in making this a dynamic relationship. Well, I don't need to, to tell you then that it's not a simple relationship and that clearly, um, as I've said, um, integrating across multiple levels, and we've seen some great examples of that today, and we need to continue to do that and unfortunately we're talking about longitudinal studies and we're talking about the necessity of grant funding so that's that's a little bit of a quandary right now uh, some of the issues that we might think are important to study indeed critical to study you know can those be packaged in RDOC terms well I'm not going to go on with that but it does require expensive long-term studies, I think, to get, uh, or, or, you know, at least that would be an ideal. It's not the only way, because clearly there are lots of uh, cross-sectional studies that will be informative. Um, so we come to the point where, um, or we have arrived and have been at the point where more and more people in the depression field are trying to study mechanisms by which stress has its effect on depression. And that, that raises um, issues having to do with the whole concept of causal analyses, causal relationships. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that shortly. But mechanisms is really where we are. We've, we've done the descriptive, um, we've accumulated a load of data, and I'd say hats off to many of you who've made strong contributions to where we've come so far and where we are now and this, uh, this exciting nexus of uh, new ideas and techniques. Um, stress, uh, depression also highlights the interpersonal uh, issues and, and we're talking about um, um, how interpersonal processes have an impact on uh, neural development, stress physiology, and reactivity, and so forth. And we've heard a lot about that today. And that's really where a lot of the action is um, in terms of mechanisms. Um, it's, it's obvious that, um, that we, and I'm preaching to the choir here, I'm happy that I've learned that today, uh, or seen evidence of that. I already knew it, but I'm, I've seen a lot of evidence. Clearly everybody understands that environmental experiences, which are so very difficult to represent on the RDOC grid, being a two-dimensional grid, but kind of embedded in, in the uh, neurodevelopmental and environmental uh, 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 context, Enver environmental effects or experiences sculpt the brain and sculpt the HPA axis, and that's um, that's been abundantly clear. Um, it's also been abundantly clear, um, but worth you know thinking about that environmental impacts that sculpt the brain and the HPA axis are mediated or moderated or at least uh, prenatally and, and in infancy um, through maternal care behavior. So developmentalists have been studying that forever but this is no time to stop so those who are interested in mechanisms 
can really shed further more precise light on what aspects of maternal care at what points and with what consequences. Um, that quote or that concept uh, comes from an article uh, by uh, uh, Bruce McEwen, uh, of course, who's really talking about um, the, 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 the big scope of, of stress on, uh, on human physiology. I'm pleased that I've, uh, I've seen and uh, in some case uh, discovered for the first time some new social models um, that really are representative of some thinking, some original and creative thinking about uh, social relatedness and how it may affect stress, physiology, and reactivity. Um, Certainly, uh, George's uh, talk, and also I recommend his uh, psych bulletin paper on the social signal transduction theory of depression. Um, there's a nice paper on uh, social relationships as regulators of the HPA axis by uh, out of uh, um, Megan Gunner's uh, group, and and they propose. Uh, the interesting idea that not only does uh, do social relationships affect the uh, effectiveness or the health of the HPA axis, but also social relationships may affect the extent to which uh, stress reactivity may be um, effectively mod modulated by social connectiveness. So the extent to which one can make use of social relationships. Um, May, uh, may arise from um, the social development of social relationships over time. I also came across a paper uh, in, uh, that's really pertaining broadly to health psychology as well as uh, mental health. Uh, uh, Marin and, and um, Miller, this is uh, uh, another Greg Miller, talking about the interpersonally sensitive disposition and how uh, it represents concern about negative social evaluation, but it is powerfully related to a good many uh, health outcomes and conditions as well as mental health. So these are a few themes from different, um, different perspectives about the importance of social relationships. So where, where do we go? Um, I want to address just a, a word or two because, as I said, this, this talk should have been at the beginning because all of these points have been made now uh, by others. Clearly, the environmental and developmental context is critically important in understanding depression. Um, the, um, this is a, a few choice ideas from um, Karmeloff Smith and Casey et al.'s paper. Um, say, environmental influences, this is just the bottom line, play a crucial role in gene expression, brain function, phenotypic outcomes. Um, the adult brain is gradually developing, and genetic and environmental factors just play a, a huge role. Um, so if, if we're going to be brain scientists, we have to be developmental brain scientists. We have to have a developmental perspective and developmentally un informed uh, models of how the brain uh, comes to be and how it works. Uh, and also um, further studies of the, the, the role of environmental impacts. I think that um, in understanding the environmental um, and developmental context, we need to consider that terms like interpersonal or social are too vague. And we really need a lot of work to specify what are we talking about, uh, how do we measure it, uh, what's important, what aspects. I can see in a whole, a whole RDOC of interpersonal phenomena that need to be developed and expanded. Uh, we don't know very much about how people socially connect with each other. I think it's safe to say that um, um, there's a lot of work to be done on that question. So I've been saying it's important, but now I have to say, but we don't know anything other than it's important. So we've got to get beyond the descriptive level and really 
deconstruct some of these concepts, um, traits, behaviors, should they be linked to RDOC constructs? How, how are they related to uh, some of the um, elements that are currently in the RDOC? Uh, do we need to develop some new relational constructs? Um, the relationship between stress and depression means that our models have to be dynamic and transactional in relation to each other and to biological elements. Well, for one thing, you know, it's, it's clear that we're not going to go as far as we need to go without a lot more just basic knowledge, just basic knowledge of normal uh, development and uh, brain functioning. Um, and we clearly need to understand how the pieces work together over time, neural, hormonal, and genetic. But in addition, we have to make sure that um, that brain people are thinking in terms of dynamic and transactional, uh, that the models that people use in, in brain research and imaging research or whatever don't, don't fall into the pit of assuming uh, static, assuming unidirectional effects. I, I think that's not likely to happen, but I think it's, it's terribly important to remember uh, those constructs as we move forward into some uh, more biological areas. Methodological issues will always be an issue for the field and psychologists are very well trained to deal with these um, and we should and we should be um, thinking not only of method development and uh, ecologically valid methods and, um, and uh, the right kinds of designs but we need to share methodologies. We need to have more labs using the same methods or sharing data or somehow putting the pieces together so that people are not constantly defining and, and inventing new measures of something or, or using a new imaging technique or, or um, in some ways we have to make sure that our technology um, uh, and our findings can, can uh, can work across different labs and share the, the data that we need to collect. Um, there's always going to be a need for conceptualization, and I, I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist putting a quote in here ab about imaging studies, although it could be uh, used for a wide variety of studies. Karmeloff, Smith, and Casey, etc., in their review paper <coughs> said, although an attractive tool, brain imaging is no better than a pencil or a fishing trip if it's not hypothesis driven. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm telling you nothing you don't already know. Um, but as I said, I think we also uh, methodologically, uh, at the methodological level as well as conceptual, we have to ask whether our tools and methods are, are really dealing with the dynamic and static processes or whether they're, they're implicitly based on some static uni, unidirectional processes. Sampling. Sampling issues are tremendously difficult, um, not just because of the, uh, the um, issue of uh, diagnostic heterogeneity or translating into smaller units of analysis, but how do we refine the phenotype? How do uh, who, who do we choose to be in studies? And no matter what sample size we choose, um, the problems of heterogeneity are still going to be there. You know, it's either going to be measured differently or ignored or whatever, but the heterogeneity is there until we really refine subtypes and a num number of other dimensions that would help us to, to have a, a greater uh, degree of certainty about whom we are uh, generalizing to in our findings. Um, this is just the, and the, and the problem is compounded by small sample studies. So that sampling will always be an issue and, uh, and heterogeneity uh, continues. Um, I, wanna, I wanna talk about one of the pitfalls of, of studying mechanisms and causality and that is the problem of reductionism. And I don't want to take too much time to, uh, to, to go into this because it's, it's put out brilliantly by uh, Greg Miller in a paper that came out in 2010. If you haven't read it, 
um, I recommend that you read it. Um, it's, it's really uh, masterful. But he basically says that um, reductionistic claims are not only erroneous, but they are detrimental. They have detrimental in implications for how funding happens or who gets funded, um, how the public understands um, what's going on in an accurate way. But, but we have to be very careful in our language and, and using words like underlying or neurological basis. So, so speak to the reductionism problem that we, we all need to do a better job um, in how we not only talk about it, but how we think about it. Um, Greg goes on to argue that reductionism that implies a direction of causality is really not possible if you're trying to show how a psychological phenomenon is really uh, caused uh, by a biological factor. And he talks about uh, the only way you can ever get a causality is by explication of the mechanisms. Um, okay. Basically, then I will um, I will just uh, end on on the the idea of um, okay, we're going to clean up depression, we're going to clean up stress, we're going to clean up social, we're going to refine these units of study and their measurement, we're going to clean up models and and studies of mechanisms so that they embody transactional dynamic and developmental and integrative approaches and more focus on the stress depression pathways. Um, I, um, I couldn't resist concluding with a few uh, predictions about what, what we might see, say, 30 years from now. Um, first of all, um, I predict that RDOC will not be the same. <laughs> Version 35.4 um, is going to depend on you guys. Okay. Um, I also predict that most of us uh, will be replaced by apps. <laughs> as clinicians, as professors, in fact, our entire universities are going to be replaced by apps. So get used to it. Uh, these huge, expensive, very complicated, technically demanding, quickly outdated imaging um, equipment will be replaced by things that our children and grandchildren understand much better than we do. And they will be able to say, uh, hold it up to the head, click, and it's done. Um, there will no longer be a need for large expensive studies with uh, lots of subjects. Um, we're going to get to the point where you'll need only about eight subjects and statistical imputation will take over from there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.